Now you see him, magic or illusion, the strange worlds of magician and escapologist Cosentino. Welcome to One Plus One, I'm Jane Hutchin. Paul Cosentino was a slow learner as a child, but he soon discovered that magic was his true language. The words came quickly after that. He's built a childhood fascination with magic and illusion into a major entertainment business helped by appearances on reality talent shows. Cosentino is appearing in a national tour. His show is Twisted Reality. Paul Cosentino, welcome to One Plus One. Thank you. I want to take you back to the most terrifying moment of your career. Talk us through it. Oh, there's a couple of examples. Um, I think maybe you're referring to when I did an underwater stunt called Dropped. And I, did, I, um, I was basically chained and locked inside a perspex bubble or sphere, dropped down 10 metres deep, and uh, it all went wrong. And I ruptured my, my eardrum, and that was the first time in doing a, an escape where I was um, genuinely concerned for my life. Scared or concerned? Both. But as an escape artist, the worst thing you can do is, is, is get scared and panic. You train yourself to be very calm. Because when you panic, you increase your heart rate, uh, you, you begin to move quickly. Uh, of course, that means if you're underwater, you're burning through oxygen. You, that's not what you want. So being concerned, what goes through your mind? At that particular stage, when I felt the, the, the pop or the rupture in my ear, I had no idea what had happened. It's funny because I had this excruciating pressure in my head and I realised I wasn't equalising properly. As you continue to, to drop down, you need to equalise. And when it first popped, I felt the relief because the pressure had gone. Of course, that was followed by that, 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 that intense pain as if someone was punching me in the ear. And then you become nauseous and you get dizzy. So when that, when that happened, I realised, okay, something's uh, drastically wrong here. And I still had two shackles on my ankles. And what really scared me is the fact that I, I was dizzy and I wasn't in my, in my element. I wasn't in control anymore. And that's when it becomes scary, when you lose control. So as a small child, were you always controlled? Did you always have a good handle on yourself? That would be a good question for my mum. <laughs> <laughs> I would say no. I think I trained myself to be like that. As a kid, I was very shy and introverted. I had low self-esteem, um, awkward, and, and not in control. And I think uh, I had a lot of learning difficulties. So I was always being dragged along to one particular class or another particular class or a particular specialist and a reading specialist, a, a speech specialist. And then, so I wasn't in control. I was being moved around. I think as a kid, as a 12 year old kid, magic gave me that sense of control. I heard that you didn't read until you were in year three. Mm. As you were aware that your mum was trying, because I think your mum was a principal, she was trying to sort of work out different ways to get you to read. Were you aware that, you know, she was kind of concerned and that maybe something was wrong? Yeah, as a kid I was. I mean, you don't exactly know 100% what's happening, but when, you're, when the other kids are going out to lunch and you're sitting with the teacher and, and you're going through you know, the reading process, or you're, you're, you've, been, you're being separated, you've been isolated from the other children and brought to another section of the classroom or whatever it may be, then you, you, you realise that as a kid. And I was conscious that my mum was trying to, to find a, uh, a way to engage me. Um, and as a principal, she'd seen this before. She was concerned. So, in a way, it was kind of your mum's and probably your dad's mission to mm. get you, this child, to, to read and be normal. 100%. So when my mother saw me open this, this book, it didn't matter what the book was, it was a book. Oh my gosh, it's a book. And I was looking at the book because it had pictures. Old vaudevillian pictures of famous magicians. Where was the book? In the library. The book was in this library that I, local library that I borrowed, in the puzzle section. See, magic... 
was in, in, in that, it wasn't in the art section or it was in the game section. So as a kid, where do I go? I go to the game section. <laughs> and I borrow this magic book and I look at these pictures. And that's what, that captures my imagination. And those pictures, you must understand, were made to uh, draw audiences in in the 1900s. So as a 12, you know, as a kid, you, you look at it and you, it's drawing mean. Mum picks up on that and she says, okay, what's this book about? She starts to read it to me. And I was interested to learn about this strange guy who had all these handcuffs up his wrist. Why did he have them? What was he doing? Was that Harry Houdini? That was Harry Houdini. And that captured my, my imagination. So mum reads me, reads the story about Houdini and who he is and what he represents. As a child, I didn't quite understand the metaphors or, you know, about escapism and liberating yourself and being free and all, all those extra things. I learned that as an adult. But as a kid, I was just fascinated by this kind of superhero character and the tricks. And there was these really cool sketches and drawings of, of you know, hands. And then my mum would read the trick and it would say, you know, um, put your left index finger here, your, you know, your, your, right, your right finger here. Yeah, and you'd break down the words and we'd begin to analyse them. And I think that process of reading, breaking it down, understanding what that word means and how it relates is how I overcame that reading difficulty. So you, you literally learned to read by magic? Literally, exactly. Why were your parents so passionate and behind you to succeed? They didn't want you to fall behind. Do you know where they got that from? I don't. I mean, I think as a parent, you, you want to give your, your children every opportunity possible. Um, you know, yeah, my, my middle brother, my brother's older, he, he has a mild cerebral palsy and, and they also wanted, they encouraged him to be as, um, to do as many activities as possible. They never really wanted him to be, um, oh, you can't do that because you, you have a disability. You know, all, all their children had some kind of uh, stumbling block. So maybe it came from there. I'm not exactly sure. Um, I can just say I, I'm very blessed that they were so um, attentive. Like, I mean, I'll give you an example. I remember learning some magic tricks and my mother would be in the kitchen. And she's busy, she's cooking, she's preparing for the family. And I would, mum, stop, let me, let me show you a trick. And she was never too busy to give me that time and that attention. So, uh, hearing, so being nurtured, I think is very important. And, and I, I, I say that to parents, I, I, it doesn't matter what it is, you need to nurture that talent. Is there a trick that you did in those very early days that is still one of your stock standard tricks? I mean, be it cards or coins, is there something you can do easily to give us an example yeah, of for sure. what you showed people? Okay, no, I can do that. Um, I'll teach you a trick. Okay. So I'll give you two rubber bands. We'll, we'll try this. So what you need to do is place the first rubber band on your, your fingers like so. Now put the rubber band behind, perfect, good. And the other finger inside, just like that. Mm -hmm. Good, okay, so now you can see that they're, they're locked on your fingers. Do you agree? I agree. Okay, so I'm gonna turn around so I can show you. If you pull the rubber bands up here, they, 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 they can't come yep. off, and on your thumb they can't come off, and if you stretch them, they can't come off, agree? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's do that again, down, stretch. Okay. Great, perfect, again, up, down, stretch. Watch the middle, and then the rubber band just it's not working? No, it's not working. Yeah, you have to keep practicing. <gasps> What's that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a magician, obviously. So little basic things like that, what does it do for a kid? Well, you know, being able to use an everyday object, some rubber bands, and being able to seemingly perform, not a miracle, but seemingly perform something that, that's quite magical, is very powerful, especially when you show an adult and you're a child, there's a transfer of power. You can do something, not, not in the way, um, you can do something that the adult can't, and not in the way that uh, now you'd say, ha, 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 I can do that, <laughs> you can't. But there is that un underlying tone that, oh. Well, okay, let me put it in perspective. As a child who's very um, shy and unsure, if you, can, if you can do something that nobody else can do, that's really powerful stuff. You feel unique, you feel special. And you've got to remember, this kid, this boy who, he feels, he feels different already because you're, take, you're, you're taken away from, from the majority. You're taken away to learn how to read. And, and so magic becomes something that you, you latch onto. So magic, in a sense, became 
instead of being a marginalized kid, it was the thing that set you apart for a completely different reason. And it gave you power. Yeah. So was that something you realized later as an adult or did you see it happening in front of you as a child? Uh, not so much as a child. The, as a child, I, I responded to the reaction. As a teenager, I realized it was that uniqueness that, that you, you begin to embrace the uniqueness. And only as an adult did I really take it on and accept it and realize that, hang on, my uniqueness, my difference, all those years of people you know, shutting doors in my, in my face and telling me, oh, you're never gonna have a magic show on TV, you'll, this will never happen. All, all, those, all that negativity of being different, of having long hair and, and being strange, so to speak, is what is, is my stock. How can someone who has, how can this thing that's so different now be my armor? It's, it's a strange transformation. So my, the only thing I can say to people is that there, there's an example of really having to stay true to yourself. You were telling me that you read a lot about Harry Houdini and you said that when you were an adult, you realized that what he was doing was that he, he was a metaphor. Mm. What was the metaphor? It's about escapism, it's, it's about his tag phrase, and I remember this as a kid, was nothing on earth can hold Houdini prisoner. And at that time, that was really powerful, and that, that, that connected with me as a kid. So for many years, you had to basically knock on doors and beg people to let you perform. Why was that? Presumably, you were pretty good at what you did. Yeah, it, that, I, I will never be able to explain uh, that 100%. You know, we would send out flyers and we had such um, rich material, such great photos and, and, and DVDs and packages because I needed to capture people's uh, agents' attention. And, and you know, it was interesting because I would always send it back and say, great material, but not really sure what to do with you. I think the, the, the problem, the challenge was they, they weren't, they weren't sure where I would fit in. So you and your brother drove around a lot, stayed in a lot of very bad motels, and you really pounded the streets to get work, didn't you? Yeah, we started out doing school shows, incursions. We would go to these schools, we'd take an hour to set up a show, we'd do a 50 minute performance, an hour packed down, we'd eat sandwiches on the run, then we'd drive an hour or two hours to the next school, do it all again, so that's six hours of just performing, two in between, then we'd get to the next, this would go on for, for, for days, weeks, Weeks. Um, you know, you got to think, you know, 17, 18 year old kid driving around and, and really, you know, pounding the pavement, knocking on doors, learning how to sell a show. We then progress to shopping centres and, and trying to um, learn how to draw an audience in who don't really care. They're walking past, walking they don't want to do their exactly. shopping. How, how do you capture their attention? And then that led to doing um, our own theatre shows, putting up posters, designing posters. What captures someone's uh, attention, their eyes? Uh, what draws people in? How do you put bums on seats? How do, you, how do you write a press release? And you graduated, you finished school with pretty good marks. You could have done really well at university in, for example, structural engineering, mm. if that's what you'd wanted to do, but you were persistent. You kept going, hoping that one day you'd get some really big break. Yeah, it was a risk. Um, I say, and I'm not trying to be disrespectful in any way, I, it would have been easier to have gone to university or finished my degree. Because at least I know there was a safety net. And I could fall back on it and I could say, oh, if it doesn't really work, I can go back to this. And that would make everyone really happy and comfortable. And, you know, parents, um, they're extremely supportive, but it would have made them comfortable too. You want your children to, to have a, a, you know, a, a strong future, a solid future. Um, being an entertainer, being a magician. There was no benchmark in Australia. So I was creating this path. There was nothing to even follow. And that was challenging for my, my folks, I think, to see. Although, like I said, they were very supportive. I, I don't know what it is. There was, I was just very tenacious about wanting to, to, to succeed. I'm not sure where that comes from. And so 2011, you were in Australia's Got Talent. What was that about and how important, in a sense, was that in, in making you? Hmm. I, 
And I've said this before, I, I was very reluctant to do the show. Reluctant because I wasn't sure how I would be received by the judges. Again, because your act was a little bit unusual. Correct. How the public on a broad scale would, would respond. Although I had done my own shows in the shopping centres and I had a lot of success there. So I kind of knew that the audience would respond or a, a, a particular audience, not a mass audience. So I didn't really want to do it. And I did it because I, I felt there was a point in my career where, you know, I mean, I, I had done so much myself. I, there, was only, there was only so much I could do now. Went on the show and um, it, it, it connected, it resonated with, with people. My story, my, 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 my performance, uniqueness. And even though you didn't win that one, you came runner-up. Was that, in a sense, all the affirmation you needed, that your show was worth it and everything you'd put into it was worth it? 100%. It, it showed that it, 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 it had connected. I mean, I was very emotional after, after that performance, uh, the last performance, and I knew that I wasn't going to win that show. I was very conscious of that. But that, it wasn't about that. It was about showcasing my talent, letting Australia see something completely different. People were flicking on, on the channel to watch a singer. So to be able to break through was, was, was pretty awesome. And so what happened after Australia's Got Talent? Did the phones start ringing? I mean, what, what is the aftermath of a show like that? Yeah, I mean, people start to call. They see you on TV. But honestly, it's all the groundwork you do before. You, you, you need to know who you are, you need to know what your act is, you need to know what, what, what markets it needs to be, you need to know how to leverage off it. But then you did Dancing with the Stars, and that one you won. The winner of Dancing with the Stars 2013 is Constantino and Jet. How important are these kind of programs in launching you nationally, making you a household name? Yeah, I mean, and that's what it did. People who weren't conscious to see a magician, so to speak, were tuning into that show to watch a singer or to watch somebody else. And here I come on, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm in front of you, and you have no choice now but to watch me because I'm hanging from my ankles from a burning rope, you know, facing death. So you kind of, oh, okay, this is an interesting guy. And all of a sudden my story comes out and you get to see me and you understand that I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, I, can't, I am the boy next door, really. So having that platform to reach those people is, is instrumental in, in my success. But then being able to capitalise on it is the next step. And so what was the dancing program about? That wasn't magic. No, that wasn't magic at all. That, again, is basically reaching a new demographic, a new audience, uh, an audience that hasn't seen my own TV shows, that had, had, maybe didn't watch the, the talent shows. And once again, a challenge that I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to try something different. I wanted to, to I, I, I do dance in my show, but I, I, not with a partner. That was a whole different um, experience and a good experience. So now you have virtually an empire which your entire family is involved in. Are they literally all part of your company? Yeah, I, I, um, my father still has his own business and my mum is still a principal. My, both my brothers work with me. Um, and when we do our, our television programs or our big demonstrations, everyone, everybody's involved all the way to Nonna who sews the costumes and that's... Nothing's changed. That's how it was in the beginning. Who is your assistant? My my assistant is my girlfriend Priscilla. So she, it's a whole it's yeah it's a whole family affair. Now that you are an industry, so to speak, does magic still have that emotional hold of you, or is it a job? Mm, that's a good question. It's um certain aspects of it are a job. Promoting it. Um, uh, making people aware of it. That, that I probably consider that the job, but a great job. I mean, being able to talk about what I do, uh, it, that's a job, but a good one. The mag I still get excited when I, when I come up with a new idea or a new concept. That's what really, really excites me. 
What about the danger aspect? I'm sure everybody asks you about this. What is it that separates someone who enjoys taking a risk with someone who perhaps crosses the line? Mm. And where's that cut-off point? Exactly. I don't know. It's... My escapes become... Well, first off, little disclaimer, the escapes are real. Real chains, real locks, real water, really holding my breath. People question it because I'm a magician. So, well, sometimes people question it because I'm a magician. You know, my... It's interesting because I'm laughing because if, if the escapes weren't real, I have no idea why my insurance is so high. I don't know, I don't know what's going on there. So, you know, there's real danger. I, I've really been to the hospital. I've been, you know, slashed up by a knife when I mistimed. I've ruptured my eardrums, I've broken ribs. What is it about the escapes seem to get more elaborate? They get more dangerous because I'm able to push the threshold. I'm able to challenge myself. If I was doing the same thing, then it's not really a challenge anymore. I've accomplished it. I'll give you a really quick example. If you're holding your breath and you're underwater, 10 meters deep, two and a half minutes, equivalent to a five minute breath hold, and you swim to the surface and you break that water, you have not had a breath for five minutes. You almost, and I'm not trying to get crazy here, but you almost feel like you're reborn. Remember, your body hasn't had oxygen. You've accomplished this huge feat and you take your first breath. Huge accomplishment, huge rush. That's an addiction. A dangerous addiction? A dangerous addiction, it really is. And, and you, I need to know how far I can push that. And, and at this stage, I don't think I've reached that, that, that threshold. You know of David Blaine. Yes. Do you study other magicians and escape artists? Definitely. I'm inspired by so many different magicians. I watched his TED talk yes. about how yeah. he managed to hold his breath for 17 minutes. Yeah. I think it was back in 2008. Eight. And I had always assumed that something like that had to be an illusion or a mm. gag of some kind. Mm. I could not imagine that someone could be underwater for 17 minutes. Mm. And he explained how he started um, researching pearl divers, mm -hmm. how to lower his heart rate, and, and then basically built up to sort of train his body and his mind. But it still seems to break the bounds of reality. Mm. It makes me think that there's something serious going on in his brain that many of us do not understand. Yeah. And I'm not sure if it's healthy. Right, it's, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, he's pushing those boundaries. He's doing a, a static breath hold where he's trained himself to, as he said, to lower his heart rate. Uh, the same, same as what I do, to lower your heart rate to the, um, to the point that everything slows down. Um, I mean, David Blaine is an interesting, um, He's an interesting individual. I mean, he's really pushed the boundaries and he's really put that type of um, performance, endurance art on the, on the map. Um, is it healthy? You would have to ask David what, he, what his opinion of, of, of what he does is. Uh, I, for, my, for what I do, I mean, I think being able to showcase, to say this is an illusion, this is a trick, and this is an escape, or maybe even blur those lines a little bit, allow, makes people question things. I think that's healthy. Is it, as you said, can you really hold your breath for that long? Is that, pos is that a trick? Is that real? That's an interesting place to be in. Uh, I think that's exciting. I think when you start to question things. I, I completely agree with where you're coming from. And it is, you know, you, you can be skeptical, but also if your mind is ever so slightly changed, that's got to be a good thing for the next stage. Yeah. Can I ask you, you're, you're, you're still young, do you think you could do what you do if you had small children? Um, it would be, I think it would be more difficult because it, uh, now there's other concerns and, and, and that may play with my, my mind. I think... Um, you're right now, now at, at this stage, I can be a little bit more selfish about what, what I do. Whereas if you need to, if you've got a family, you need to take care of them. Yeah, it, it brings up other issues and challenges that fortunately for me at this stage, I'm, I, I don't have that um, responsibility. Maybe that's why I don't have that responsibility. What do you dream of? What's your ultimate goal? 
This might sound strange, but ultimately I want, I want my, my show, my stage show, my theatrical show to, to be in Broadway. The best performers play Broadway. Not Vegas, but Broadway. As a performer, as an artist, uh, to reach people, inspire them around the world. On that, it's interesting because we get so many emails from, 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 kids, from adults, children, um, teenagers telling me, you know, they saw me, me do a demonstration or saw a piece of magic and it, and it, and it, and it moved them. That's when your art is, is, is bigger than just a, a piece of a, a trick. So that is, um, if I can continue to do that and, and, and reach people around the world, I think that's pretty, pretty special. Do you lie awake worrying about anything at night time? that I'm not going to reach my full potential. You know when you understand inside yourself that there's more to give, there's more for you to show the world, that you haven't even come close to showing your, your best, that maybe I won't have the opportunity to, to get there. That worries me. That I won't be as, as good as I feel I can be. That scares me. Well, I'm gonna give you an option to redeem yourself got three fan towels. Here right. you go. Thank you. Okay. And my job is to eat them? <laughs> you can eat them or you can make them disappear. Oh, okay. Well, I'll have one. <laughs> you can have one. Thank you. Um, let me try something here for you. If I get you to hold this one for me. But... Oh. <laughs> Come on, cough up. <laughs> yeah. There you go. They're tasty. They're good, aren't they? Mm. Paul Cosentino, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for speaking with me on One Plus One. Thank you very much. One Plus One is available on iView. You can browse the archive or contact us through the website. Stay in touch and leave comments via Facebook. You can also follow me on Twitter. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye. I'll do a very, very simple card trick for okay. you. Okay. That's the one, two, three, four cards, just like that. Okay. okay. So the first two card, or first card, is the Joker. Joker. Okay. It's not a very good card. Okay, so I want you to hold onto the Joker just like that parallel. Perfect. Okay. Don't do anything else. Good. Perfect. The second card is also the Joker. Can okay. You see that? Okay. Great. I want you to hold onto that as well. The other hand. Perfect. And the next card is also the Joker. Mm -hmm. And the Joker. So there's four Jokers. Okay. I'm gonna put the Jokers together.